In today's market, we're very much used to AMD and Nvidia dominating the entire scene. But what if I told you I spent the last week doing modern gaming on a Matrox graphics card? So this right here is meant to be the Matrox C420, a DirectX 12 compliant graphics card that I picked up off eBay for just under £30 over here in the UK. Prices vary but when you do find them on auction they don't tend to sell for very much but scalpers still try and get about 200 quid for them so they are quite a rare card. But how can this card exist and why is no one talking about it? I mean a new Matrox graphics card that is DirectX 12 compliant and was made in recent years. Well, just to recap real quick, there is already two parts of the Matrox story on this channel, touching on their downfall as a company. But for those of you that don't know Matrox, they had promised the world a gaming graphics card in the late 90s through to the early 2000s. There were lots of rumours, lots of speculations, but what was released turned out to be the Matrox G550, more or less a refresh of their last generation card. After this though, the market was demanding more and more gaming cards. It was the boom of the 2000s PC gaming era. And at last we got one. The Matrox Parhelia, and honestly it had it all. Brilliant API support, phenomenal output quality, it even had super sampling and overclocking support in the drivers over 20 years ago. It seemed like nothing could go wrong. But it did. See, no one remembers the Parhelia because ATI launched the even more legendary Radeon 9000 series, which turned the Parhelia into sort of an expensive niche card, which it really wasn't meant to be. I've done a full video covering the Parhelia. It's honestly a fantastic gaming graphics card, but it just doesn't compete with ATI's legendary 9000 series. It just couldn't do it. Given this, it led to slumping sales and a rapidly advancing market, meaning that Matrox left the consumer market by around 2004. So if Matrox left the consumer market, how on earth do they have a DirectX 12 capable graphics card out on the market which I can just find on eBay and buy? Well see, the Matrox C420 didn't come out too long ago and actually came about due to them retiring their older cards. But with the older cards being retired, they needed a graphics chip to actually power their new cards. So what they actually ended up doing was not developing a new card because that would be extremely expensive. They instead opted to use a tweaked Cape Verde graphics chip provided by AMD in early 2015. And for those of you that don't know what Cape Verde is, it made up the entirety of AMD's budget range from APUs to the HD7750 being rebranded into the Fire Pros and the R7250s. It even made its way into the Xbox One. So it is a very well known graphics chip and had a lot of support on the AMD side within reason, but given that it was so well supported it meant that there were a lot of surplus chips, making it ideal for Matrox to base their new graphics card off this architecture. So they took that, tweaked it quite a bit, made it their own and well, they made a big comeback with this. And honestly, it's been quite exciting to make this video, but what are the specifications on Matrox's big comeback. Announced in mid 2014, the idea was to repurpose an older and very common AMD produced graphics card with Matrox provided drivers on a Matrox PCB, making it a hybrid between Matrox and AMD. It's all very odd and it does tend to lean towards being more Matrox than it is AMD, at least when you actually get the card in your computer and you start using it. At first sight I just thought this is just going to be a normal AMD graphics card with a Matrox badge on it. It really isn't, it's a completely different beast entirely. Featuring a rather nice 512 shading units, 2GB of rather nice Hynix GDDR5 VRAM, it has all the latest API support even being a DirectX 12 compliant card given its 28nm GCN1 origins. This all finds itself compacted down onto a very little card that barely uses 15 watts under full load. So where's the downside? How have Matrox managed to essentially produce a really really nice SFF card based on surplus AMD chips? They've made their own card here, it's really impressive. 
Well, the card is near enough locked at 300 megahertz on core and on the memory, something that I tried to get around with but not a great deal of success. You'll see that later on in the video as well. I've got plenty of content coming towards your way on this Matrox card. But still, I've seen these popping up for around £30 on eBay auctions, which prompted me to actually get a hold of this card. There are a lot of scalpers out there asking for over 200 quid for one of these, and it's not worth paying that for it, so just wait for a nice auction if you really want to get hold of one. But on paper, for a low power card, this certainly seems to have a lot of power. But what exactly does this mean in the real world? Now this is going to be incredibly strange, but we are going to be using the Matrox graphics card paired with my Ryzen 7 3700X. Thankfully, all the drivers are based on modified AMD code and all certified and supported by Matrox. So the idea is, is that they've used an older AMD Crimson base and then they've added in their own program optimizations, their own fallbacks and all those types of things. This gives it some fairly decent program optimization and the stability and support that Matrox are almost famed for at this point. In fact, dare I say, Matrox have done 10 times a better job at making AMD drivers than AMD does themselves. You've got to remember that these are the guys that were offering super sampling on an AGP graphics card. In fact, even while I write this on my script, I've just had my Nvidia drivers crash. That has never once happened to me on a Matrox card. And I've been using this one for a week and a half, two weeks now. I've essentially been living with this Matrox card. Now, before I get into the benchmarks, I did do some testing to see if we could get an overclock running on the card as it runs at 300 megahertz on core and memory, which is a tad low compared to most cards on the market. The card, however, doesn't want to seem to budge, which is something I'll be touching on later on, but for now, we want to find out how a new, somewhat new, pretty much a sort of semi-recent Matrox graphics card actually holds up in the benchmarks. Starting us off with GTA 5, something I doubt anyone would ever thought we'd see running on a Matrox card, yet alone one that is barely using around 15 watts. The performance was surprisingly decent given that we had the game running with normal settings, soft shadows and a HD resolution. Although not an overwhelmingly high frame rate, it was exceptionally stable, something you'll notice across a lot of the benchmarks. Either way, for a card from a now relatively obscure company, and for one that isn't even meant for gaming, this isn't half bad performance. Utilization also saw itself maxed out the entirety of the time, which was very nice to see, especially on a card that isn't officially supported. Moving on from here, we have the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, which also ran very nicely. There was quite a large disparity between the open world and when you're in a caved in, caved in? Closed in cave, or an environment like that, much more than you'd expect, most likely down to the limited bandwidth being provided by the memory given its lower clocks. Still, with the medium setting selected, it looked great, and you have got to remember, the last graphics card we had by Matrox was only just about able to start Morrowind. The performance in the respective regions was very stable though, so I actually had quite a good time playing it. I played it for quite a while. I did expect a little bit more given how well the game ran GTA 5, but then again, we're comparing an incredibly optimized title to a bit of a Bethesda mess. Now, given the slightly underwhelming nature of the last benchmark, this one certainly came as a surprise. Mountain Blade Bannerlord is still under active development and is a very recent game, and I wasn't expecting it to be playable on any level with a Matrox graphics card, but we saw a remarkably stable frame rate of just over 30 FPS the majority of the time. This was using a 75% resolution scale with the 720p base resolution, but the game didn't look too bad. Larger battles could of course be a bit of a struggle, but provided you limited yourself with the battle size, you can in fact play the latest installment of the Mountain Blade series on a Matrox graphics card. Given this success though, I may have been pushing things just a little bit too much here, but we have probably a world first, Red Dead Redemption 2 running on a Matrox graphics card. And it wasn't exactly what I'd call playable, but it was stable. I know it sounds ridiculous, most of the time when you see 15 FPS on most Nvidia or AMD cards, the frame times are ridiculous and you can't play the game. But the fact this game launched, and the fact it was running at a relatively stable, albeit low frame rate, meant that you could almost play the game if you really hated your eyesight. This was of course using DirectX 12, and I know it's unplayable, but it controlled very responsively, and was very strange, especially for Red Dead Redemption 2 on PC. So Red Dead Redemption 2 is possible on a Matrox card. 
The Sims 4 is using the latest 64-bit version of the game with plenty of expansion packs and custom content and all that, and it did run alright. Most of the games have been a bit of a mess to capture, but this one was incredibly unpleasant to screen capture. Other than that major issue though, it did run really nicely on the Matrox card. Higher settings and resolutions completely overwhelmed the minuscule memory bandwidth of the card, but provided you were happy with 720p HD and medium high settings, you wouldn't run into any issues with the Matrox C420 here. Now, CSGO is not an easy game to run anymore, and I tried to achieve the highest frame rate possible with competitive settings, so that meant 640x480 in resolution and higher shadows and low settings everywhere else. But we saw around 70 FPS on average in the casual game mode, which is a bit more intensive than competitive, and the game didn't fluctuate too far from that. I know it's not a competitive frame rate in a sense, but it was more than responsive enough for me to play the game. Although things like smokes and explosions could cause us to see our lower frame rate leading to our 1% lows, it was still very playable, albeit a little bit blurry. Another new title with Star Wars Fallen Order, which ran better in game than it did in the menu. I'm genuinely being serious when I saw the options menu run at around 3 FPS. Meanwhile, in game, we could see anywhere from 15 FPS up to 35 FPS. In some instances, the game was even playable. I know you'd have to go through a rigmarole of things to configure the game to access the hidden low settings. I have no idea why they've decided to hide the low options. But genuinely, if you unlock those, you might actually be able to push this game over the edge of actually being playable. But still, if it can't run Star Wars Fallen Order, can it run Crisis? Well, yes actually, and quite well. You won't be seeing much over 30 FPS unless you aren't actually doing anything, but the game does run very nicely with the medium high settings used. And given that fabled Matrox stability, although we had some rather heavy dips in action, they weren't very noticeable in general gameplay. If I didn't have MSI Afterburner running, I wouldn't have known anything had actually changed in terms of frame rate. Then finally to round us off, we have to give a reminder of the last Matrox card to come out on the market, which was of course the Parhelia. And here we have them both running Half-Life 2, and this time running with the latest HDR version of the game at a full 60 plus FPS with high settings. Something that was completely unimaginable on the Parhelia. Not that I don't absolutely love that card, I've still got in a system to this day. But that was seeing a fluctuating frame rate even on the original 2004 port of the game at far lower settings and resolution. So this card seems to have offered everything it was meant to. Better, for for better performance? Better performance, better stability, and the same great Matrox support. The best bit is, it wasn't even made for gaming, and they've already beaten their gaming card without trying to. And well, it wasn't made for it, but it can do it pretty damn well in my opinion. So overall in the benchmarks, that was some pretty decent performance. The main issue I ran into was that Windows doesn't really recognise this as a graphics card in a lot of databases, along with software that usually looks for the usual AMD, Nvidia or Intel graphics cards in their databases. In most things, this wasn't an issue other than a little pop-up when you start a game saying, we don't know this graphics card, it's not supported, it's out of date and things like that. But in reality, the main issue I had was the built-in Windows Recorder, which is absolutely fantastic for those of us that benchmark because it's very lightweight and gives great quality recordings. But it would just sort of start to record and throw up an error code when it was enabled. The same was the case for my usual fallback after this, which is Loilo Game Recorder, which wouldn't run at all, so it meant that I had to do a lot of my captures with the built-in MSI Afterburner Recorder. So what you are seeing is a few FPS lower than what it was when you weren't running that recorder, it can be rather intensive. Failing that, I'd have to run OBS in a little window, which did work, but proved even more intensive than MSI Afterburner. Remember, we're not working with high memory bandwidths or things like that here, so asking this card to multitask in very graphically intensive applications, it does well in terms of stability, in terms of poor performance, it can be better. Now what is strange is that the card does show up as having AMD VCE support, which makes sense given it's based on the Cape Verde core, I mean even the Xbox One came with it. The recording quality seems to be capped fairly low, and I think that is kind of what's making recording rather hard, as it's trying to engage this built-in recording feature without understanding that it's a Matrox card, not an AMD product. So it's seeing the AMD software side of things, but it's not understanding that it's Matrox hardware it's dealing with. 
However, when it came to 3D Mark, the software at first does recognize our graphics card as a Matrox card. When it actually gets uploaded online, submitted to 3D Mark, it just shows up as an unnamed card. It can't figure out what it is. It's got all the specifications, all the benchmark data, but doesn't actually list it as a Matrox card. And another issue, all the tests are greyed out because it isn't found in their databases. So it says it doesn't support any of the benchmarks. But we've already got full knowledge that this is a DirectX 12 compliant card and we've already ran DirectX 12 applications. So I decided to run TimeSpy, which did run and did run alright. If it was a PowerPoint, that is. To see if I could improve performance somewhat, this is where the overclocking comes in. And this is also where things get a little bit more interesting. No matter what software you use, even the ancient OG Matrox overclocking toolkit, the card still seems to detect instability and enters a fallback mode. Now this is where things really differ from the AMD side of things. Matrox have made these cards for stability. The idea is they will never go wrong. You can leave them on forever and it will just work. I tried lots of workarounds, I tried unofficial overclocking extensions, but virtually any attempt to overclock this card failed. I briefly had the card running with higher power limits and an extra 10 megahertz on core, but it quickly dropped out very quick after that and you couldn't go much higher. The upside to this is I genuinely could not get this card to crash. No matter what you do, how much you push this card, it has a fallback mode. So instead of just crashing to a black screen and having to restart your computer, no, it is, it is designed to detect that instability and it will come back with lower clocks. I think it locks to around 125 megahertz on core and memory, if my memory's serving right, and it makes it brilliant for its actual use cases, things like business use. I mean, personally, I might put this in a little HTPC or emulation machine, because having those Matrox drivers and that Matrox support with that great acceleration we've just seen, I mean, I could just go for a normal AMD Cape Verde card, but why would I want that when Matrox have taken that and made it a much better and much more stable experience, all while using far less power? Without a great deal left to test, I did give emulation a quick go, as I noticed OpenGL performance seemed noticeably smoother on the Matrox card than on its AMD counterparts. This extended well into the worlds of GameCube and Wii emulation, which worked fine with upscaling to 720p and sometimes beyond depending on the title, and the same even went for the original Xbox, and of course the Sega Dreamcast, with performance being on par if not better than the base console. Which I know sounds absolutely ridiculous, but Matrox have inadvertently made a brilliant little arcade and emulation graphics card by offering stability, great OpenGL acceleration, and just fixing an AMD design this is essentially what they've done. They've taken this sort of, you know, well supported on AMD side and just making it excellent. There's no other way to talk about this card. They've actually done a lot of work here to actually make me really appreciate what they've done. So in conclusion, the Matrox C420, do I recommend it? Well, not really. I absolutely love the fact I've got a hold of this little card, but people see these huge RRPs that they came out with back when they were initially released and still try to sell them for around £200 plus on eBay a lot of the time, with the rare auctions that are listed being the only way to actually get a hold of one of these at a reasonable price. Considering this was released well over 10 years since the Parhelia actually, it has been an interesting one. It has been a clever strategy by Matrox to take a common AMD base and add all the Matrox stability and support we've come to expect from the brand. It all operates hardly using any power and it's a bit of a shame that these were never offered as a bit of a more mainstream card as this offers slightly below console power in a 15 watt power envelope and is actually available in small form factor. You could stick this in a little 10 quid HP and expect near Xbox One level performance. But still, Matrox is back and I really hope I can cover some of their other newish cards, as let me just tell you, this was the entry level card of their return. There are more powerful cards based on AMD cards entirely produced by Matrox. So thank you very much for watching, I hope you've enjoyed this video and good night.